Hello everyone, my name is Michael and I'm an advisor here at the Berklee College of Music, specifically for the, the online school. I'm also a composer, performer, producer, and, and arranger. And uh, we've done several of these open house events in the past. We've done dozens of them actually, so thank you for coming. Uh, today we're lucky enough to be joined uh, with or by Stephen Weber, who uh, teaches both online and here on campus in Boston. He's the author of our music production analysis class. Uh, which has won the best online course award uh, back in 2010. It's a perennial favorite. <laughs> um, he's made a boatload of records, developed a wonderful curriculum here on campus on how to produce effective records. Um, or, yeah, he travels the world giving seminars, master classes, and of course producing records. His most recent projects have been working on the Generations Music Project with DJ Premier and Nas. Mm -hmm. uh, on that pro project, he actually co produced, orchestrated, conducted, and made beats. He also wrote and performed his Stylus Symphony, which you can see all over YouTube, and I believe at stylussymphony.net, Yes, uh, which you should exactly. definitely check out. You should check out both of those projects. Um, and lastly, he's just written a new course online with us called uh, Music Production from Pre-Production to Final Audio Master. It's kind <laughs> it's of a mouthful, mouthful yeah. but it's, it's good. Um, and we're going to have about 20 minutes of a discussion between Stephen and I, mostly him uh, talking about about this course and about everything that goes along with it. Uh, and then we're going to open it up for about 10 minutes or so of Q&A between you and Steven. So make sure that you um, hit that handy chat bar, which I think is on the right side. I'm not sure which side of the camera that would be. <laughs> um, but post your questions there, and then we'll feed them to Steven after we're done here. So talking about your new course, Steven, um, can you tell us a little bit about the course and who it's for? Sure, yeah. That's a good question, who it's for. Um, this is actually uh, a little more of an advanced production course. Mm -hmm. uh, this is for people who already have um, some skills. They've already been down the road a ways. Um, this is, some of this course, it, it's, it's really an experiential learning course in that uh, there are some pretty major projects involved. And so a lot of the learning that takes place is through these challenges in the production projects sure. themselves. And this mirrors the uh, curriculum that we have here at Berklee College of Music in Boston in the Music Production and Engineering Department, which you know is an is a oft-copied um, uh, <laughs> curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, our student, you know, it, it, music production and engineering here at Berkeley has been up and running for 25 years or something now, and you can't turn on the radio or go see a film or anything without hearing the work of the alums of, of this program. Right. You know, everything from the uh, uh, soundtrack for the Hunger Games to LMFAO to, you know, you name it. I mm -hmm. mean, our, our alums are, are, are making these records and recording these soundtracks. So, you know, the challenge was to try and take some of the elements that really work from the production curriculum mm -hmm. uh, that happen here at the campus and adapt them to an online experience. And I'm really excited about this because it's going to expand the scope of you know, who we can reach um, and who can actually take advantage of these things um, exponentially. Um, right. Because you don't have to come to Boston. You don't have to be involved. Right. But basically the course is, it is, it is um, uh, a course that's somewhat of a hybrid, and then there's a lot of new stuff too, but it's somewhat of a hybrid of the two um, mid-level production courses in the uh, music production engineering curriculum. Okay. Um, and so these are courses that happen after there's been a, a pretty good, you know, um, um, grounding in you know, the basics, you know. And, you know, at this point uh, here at, at, at Berkeley Music uh, Online, I mean, there's there's so many wonderful courses here at Berkeley Music Online. Mm -hmm. um, uh, production analysis, you mentioned uh, critical listening. Um, we, we kind of assume that you've got those listening chops already. Mm -hmm. We assume that you are pretty well uh, versed on uh, a DAW, that you've got some DAW chops, right. that you can, you know, you can always already make a record, you know what it means to, to put up a mic and record something, and, and you know what it means to mix something, and you know right. what it means, you know, basically you're, you're comfortable with the terminology if we say, you know, getting the median plane, you know, you know what that is. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. So it, it really is something that's, that's for people who have now a little bit more experience and they really want to try and expand into that next level. They want to take their production chops up to that next level 
they really want to be challenged. Um, they want to get feedback on what, what it is that they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from a professional and from the other people in the class, which is, you know, a wonderful thing about these uh, Berkeley Music Online classes is the community that really forms in the class and you have, you know, you have people chiming in on your ideas and your projects from, from all over the world and, and right. all walks of life and, and you know, it, professionals and, and people who are, you know, working in bedroom studios and people who are mm -hmm. on tour with major acts and, you know, it, it really is, it's an amazing community that forms and, and uh, I, I often feel like, you know, that's one of the great things about education in general is just you know is the is the is the community that you that you really create and that can be either in the classroom or it can be on the online classroom yeah so we want you know we want i, I want to make it clear that this this class you know if if you just are starting out and you you know you haven't really done much recording yet uh -huh. you you should probably take some other classes first right. you, know, you should probably get your chops up but if you have been doing this for a while you know the, the the typical person and this is you know we're just going into this for the first semester but i i'm thinking the typical person will probably have already made some demos maybe they've even made a few cds maybe right. you know they've made some independent projects mm -hmm. and they feel like you know i really need to take this to the next level or maybe they've you know they've been uh, writing songs, they've been um, they've been recording things, um, and you know they they want to get out and and do some collaboration and and really, you know, figure out what what they can do to kind of get up to that next that next level. Right, right. Um, I was looking at the class a little bit, and I noticed in that one of the concepts in the first lesson you mm -hmm. talk about is LRA or or. Lura, I think Lura. is how you call Lura. Um, <laughs> could you talk a little bit about what yeah, that is? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd be happy to. This is a this is a you know a concept that that's really uh, um, it's so simple. It seems like absolute common sense, mm -hmm. but then when you really start to break it down, and and having now taught for quite a few years, uh, record production and, and engineering, it's amazing how how people discard this. And usually, right. when people get in trouble um, in their projects. It's you know you can trace it back to you know just the simple common sense approach that maybe was skipped. Right. So Lura, it, it's basically just L R A and the three the three what it stands for is listen, respond, and act. And let, let's break those down a little bit. So first off. It's amazing how much people don't listen. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. In the studio, you get you get into your uh, DAW world, and you're pulling things up, and you're doing things, and yeah. you know it kind of becomes about the process. Same thing with, you know, if you've got a, a session with with people in front of you, you know, it's about just getting the signal flow going, and sure. you're making sure the mics come in the right place, and getting you know getting signal into your into your Pro Tools rig or whatever, and uh, you know, and then you go to use a compressor and or an EQ, and there's all these flashing lights and cool graphics and uh -huh. it's all great but you know it's so amazing how you know people don't listen that the, the way that they should which is right. why I think critical listening and, and music production analysis are such great choruses mm -hmm. for people to really take a deep breath and remember why they love music in the first place and why it works and what the components are and what the you know the elements of, of mm -hmm. really effective records are so so first off is listening the second thing is to respond and um, I know this seems again this seems like common sense but so often I think especially once people have some experience in the studio um, they think they're hearing things but they're 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 listening on on just with just part of their 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 person mm -hmm. either they're listening just entirely technically you know so they're just they're just hyper focused on is there noise in the signal sure. or is there too much bass or is it out of phase or you know they have a few technical things that they've they've kind of learned that they're they're super hyper focused on um, or they're you know they're not they're they're just listening on an emotional level, which is you know it's good to listen emotionally, but you know you also want to notice if if you're distorting terribly <laughs> and and right. you know if if uh, uh, you, you know if you're not really getting uh, what you need. Sure. So you know responding on all levels on an emotional level, you know is the emotion there in the performance? Um, are you know do I understand what's going on here in the in the lyric and is that moving me? Am I being swept up in 
into it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know why? You know why is it that I'm not responding to that? Well, maybe it's because you know there's there's this this awful guitar or hi hat that's just poking me right in the ear. Right. So I'm not you know that's drawing my attention away. You know, sure. respond to what it is that you're hearing. You're not you know this is it, we're we're really entering a, a, an era now. I think well we're in the era where the producer and the engineer have on so many projects become the same person. So we're asking, you know, ourselves and our professionals who are who are doing this, mm -hmm. you know, to operate on so many levels at once. Um, and and the the real challenge I find when I'm producing and engineering at the same time is just kind of going between left brain and right brain thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, where I am thinking about signal flow and I am thinking about noise and I am thinking about you know phase and I'm thinking about all these issues. And then also, you know, interfacing with an artist who's a living, breathing human being with needs and, and right. you know, and, and, and insecurities and, and the potential to do amazing things, you know, and, and mm -hmm. trying to have all this going on at, at once. So, so being able to listen and then respond to what you're hearing, you know, and, and actually think, you know what, I'm, I'm not liking... What's going on in the guitar now? Why is that? Let me let me think. Let me respond to why that is. Okay, you know what? It's there's a buzz. Actually, there's a really there's a big buzz. So then the third thing is act. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I can't tell you how many times a student, uh, one of my production students that I'm mentoring, will come in to a seminar or a class and they'll play their project for us. Mm -hmm. And everybody will say, oh my gosh, you know, this pulled me out of it. You know, the, the, the vocal is absolutely buried. I can't understand it or, you know, whatever, any number of things that, 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 could, that could be going on. And the, the, the producer who made that track will say, yeah, you know, I noticed that as it was going down, but... You know, there was so much going on. I mean, we had just spent all this time tweaking the kick drum, or, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, they failed to act. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's like they were listening, they had a response, but they didn't follow it through to actually act. And right. it's so important, especially when you're recording with a room full of musicians, to make sure that what you're doing, you know, because that's potentially a hard thing to put together. It's either going to be very expensive to either hire them in again, or if it's a band, you know, that's making a record that you're working with, just, you know, getting everybody together, getting everybody set up, getting all the sound, you know. Once it's there, you've got to make sure that what you're getting is what you want. Mm. So you've got to listen, you've got to respond, and then you've got to act. You've got to take swift action in a case like that to where you can make sure that you are getting what you need and everything mm -hmm. is going to come out the way that you want it to be. So that's, you know, there's so many examples of how this works. But really, if you, it's just like one of those, you know, one, one of those uh, common sense things that you can keep going back to. And, and, I, and I often notice, you know, just myself in the studio when I'm in there and maybe it's been a long day and maybe I'm a little tired or, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, I'm getting ready to listen to, to a mix or I'm getting ready to, to produce a band. You know, just thinking, okay, listen, respond, act, listen, respond, act. So, you know, just kind of differentiate from, okay, we were getting ready to do this. Okay, now we're really going to do this, you know. Right. And, and if I'm working with a singer, you know, we're finally ready to start recording. Okay, I can forget about the signal chain. Now my gig is to listen and to respond and to act and to help them do the best work that they've ever done, hopefully. Yeah. Um, some of the projects in the class, uh, well, there's two big projects in the class, yeah, but yeah. the first one is a sound-alike, um, right. right. which I've, I'm kind of familiar with. I've heard some people do sound-alikes before, but maybe you can tell us what a sound-alike is and, and why it's important <laughs> to do an exercise like that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the, the first project, the first project in the, in the course is the sound-alike project. Mm -hmm. And basically what you're doing in the sound-alike project is you are actually recreating a record of your choice um, that has a substantial grouping of live musicians. Mm -hmm. And you are recreating it um, technically, you are recreating it musically, and you are recreating it emotionally as okay. well. It's got to work on every single level, which is an amazing exercise. You know, people, uh, you know, at Berkeley who have been doing this for years often at the end will just, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of these exercises that, that you wind up learning so much from. And this is, there's a long tradition. If you were, if you were a composer mm -hmm. during the Renaissance, um, basically what you would do for the first few years is you would copy out scores. 
Right. You know, there were no printing presses, you know, back then. Mm -hmm. So, you know, adding scores to the lexicon was a huge deal, but that's how you would learn. You would actually, you know, try and recreate the scores of the masters before you. Right. Um, and in some ways, this is very much in the same vibe. Um, it's funny because a lot of the folks that I've talked to, I actually used to make sound alikes myself when I was a kid, and, and practically everybody I know who, you know, when the, you first get a tape recorder, I, I, the first tape recorder I had that I could multi-track on was actually a Sony reel-to-reel -reel that had sound on sound. Okay. So we could record, you know, one track, me and Brent Davis, my, my good buddy who I was, you know, exploring this stuff with, we'd record the both of us playing on one track, and then we'd play back with that, and we'd have to, the trick was that you had to erase it while you were going, you know, sound on sound to the next thing. And we'd try to recreate these records, and we learned so much. Um, in, uh, in, in January, actually, one of the, another interesting thing about this course is that I, I've actually done a ton of interviews with people, um, different producers and engineers and artists um, and songwriters about making records. And, and sprinkled in in all the lessons are interviews with people about the exact things that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And Todd Rundgren, I remember this, um, he actually made a record in the 70s, in like 76 or so, called Faithful. Mm -hmm. And side A was actually Todd doing sound alikes. Oh, Todd really? did sound alikes of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and um, and uh, uh, Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. And you know he was doing these sound alikes of these pivotal records that had meant a lot to him in his life. And the funny thing is that that uh, Good Vibrations actually got released by the record company as a single. And charted higher than Good Vibrations <laughs> by the Beach Boys, and charted <laughs> when it was originally released, you know, oh which gosh. was, you know, and he didn't. It wasn't his intention. That's he comes out in the interview. It wasn't his intention at all to right. to release that. But you know, DJ started playing it and saying, "Guess who this is?" You know, it was kind of this little joke. But he really recreated the record. Um, you know, he did a sound alike basically. So you wind up learning so much about everything from from timbre to you know, the way that parts put together to really about, there's so much that you wind up learning about conveying emotion in a record. You know, mm -hmm. how absolutely 100% um, into it that you have to be. You know, it, it, part, of the, part of the difference I find between you know, real records, record, you know, records that are super effective, that, mm -hmm. that we all know and love, that are on the radio and that are on our iPods and, you know, and that we purchase and that we, that we buy. Uh, one of the main differences between those and, and records made by people who are coming up who don't quite have it yet is that they do sweep us away. Mm. You know, we're not thinking about the fact that somebody is singing a song. We're falling into the song you know we believe what they're saying right. you know it's kind of like watching a film if you if you can kind of see the actor acting mm -hmm. you know it totally takes you out of it you know you really want to be totally into it and and believe what's going on and the same thing is true in in recordings and it's not just in the vocals it can be in the drums you know is the drummer really playing with conviction you know it, it can be in, in all the parts and to really try and recreate something with the same conviction and the same emotional impact as the original is is a big challenge and it's right. it's something that that everybody everybody that does this project learns so much from right um in the second project at first of all i really like that analogy <laughs> about the uh, about the movie actor that yeah. really resonated <laughs> nicely um but you have another project and, and we're a little short on time but it's really important to kind of get into this it's, it's a big yeah it's part. A, it's yeah, I want to talk about the collaboration aspects. Right, right, yeah, absolutely. The second project is a, is a project where you are producing another artist. And both of these projects actually have a lot of collaboration in them. The first one, um, you are required to use live musicians other than yourself, including you need to do a session, you need to do your basic tracking session with at least three people. Right. So you've either got to figure out a way to make your project studio work for, you know, to record three people at the same time mm -hmm. or, you know, make friends with somebody who has, a, you know, or maybe you and a friend put together your gear or you can go rent studio time if you want. You can barter. You can do, you know, whatever you need to. 
But we really feel in, in mp e here at Berkeley that, that the collaboration aspects and the complexity of recording at least three people at the same time on a session mm -hmm. is something that you really need to do. You're going to learn so much from that, you know, right. uh, rather than just sequencing and doing it at home in your bedroom. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sure, maybe you could make that sound exactly like the record, too, and that would be great. Yeah. But you're going to learn so much by the collaborative aspects of this, you know. Um, then the second project is a project where you uh, collaborate with another artist. Now this can be a band, this can be a singer-songwriter, this could be a rapper, mm -hmm. um, but you are actually going to collaborate with another artist. We call it the Original Artist Single Project. Okay. And so what you're going to do at first is you're going to get together with them, you're going to go through all their material, you're going to whittle it down to three songs, you're going to make simple work tape demos of those three songs with them. Uh, you're going to choose the one song that you're going to do as the single. Yeah. You're going to try and work with them to strengthen the material, to really you know, bring out the best mm -hmm. things that you can in that material, and work with them to bring out the best performances. Uh, you're going to do a, a, a much more full-blown demo of that track, and then you're going to record it and try always, I mean, we're going to hold you to a professional standard, sure. you know, a professional standard of let's make something that's really going to hold water, let's, that's going to uh, convey emotion, that's going to meet professional standards, mm -hmm. um, and is going to be an effective, you know, record that people would want to actually pay money yeah. to, 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 to purchase. Um, it's, you know, record production is is one of the more challenging art forms in that you know, if, if you're a songwriter, you need to know how to write good songs. You know, mm -hmm. if you're a singer, you need to know how to sing well. If you're a guitar player, you need to know how to play guitar well. If you're a record producer, you need to know all those things, mm -hmm. you know, plus the engineering and the technical side of it. But then you also need to be able to convince your songwriter that, you know, actually this would be more effective, you know, or, right. you know, figure out ways of collaborating with them to really engender trust. Mm -hmm. You know, it really is all about trust, you know. Um, figuring out how you can really get on the same page with, with another human artist yeah. and collaborate with them in such a way that you can take them to a level that they couldn't have gotten to themselves. And that's really what this course is about. Mm -hmm. is about there's a lot of very specific tools that we go through, there is pre-production meetings, there are a lot of ideas on how to, just, just to take one for, for example, um, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, uh, that we do is, is a, is a pre-production you know, activity with your artist. Something I've found really useful for years is as soon as I sign on to produce an artist, mm -hmm. um, we'll go to the art museum together. And we just go and we walk around the art museum and we just talk about what it is we're seeing. And, you know, we have fabulous art museums here in Boston. Sure. So, that, you know, it always, you know, engenders amazing conversation about art, about life, about all these aspects, apart from their music. Mm -hmm. And I learn so much about what makes them tick as an artist. I've, I learn their vocabulary, which again makes them comfortable then when I'm speaking their language, mm -hmm. you know, when we're actually in the thick of it, you know, working on their material and, and working in the studio. If I can express things in a way that they're going to understand what I'm saying and not think that I'm just trying to, you know, do something to get them to sell out and sell more records, yeah, you know, which is definitely. where you don't want it to go. Right. Um, so there's a lot of of uh, psychology <laughs> in this course, really. Um, and there is a lot of uh, just exploring this whole avenue of collaboration with other artists. Because yeah. even, you know, even if you're a songwriter and you want to be an artist yourself and you, you know, produce your own beats, um, you're going to be in a position um, once things start happening for you. Uh, Carmen's a good example. You know, sure. now they're working with, they're collaborating with all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. You know, with Dr. Luke and with, uh, you know, just I mean, they're, you know, they're in there collaborating with people, right, all the time, every day. And collaboration is such a huge part of anybody's career. 
Um, you know, nobody really does it entirely alone. We do have these tools where you can do a lot alone now, mm -hmm. but the goal really is to kind of get to that place where you're not doing it alone. You're right. collaborating with other artists, you're collaborating with other producers, you're collaborating with other musicians. And I got to tell you, that's a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. We, we have some questions that Great. came in. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, this is something that we actually get a lot. Um, it's from TKD Tomcat. Um, but they want to know how essential is reading music um, if you're a producer? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I know we see all sorts. Yeah, um, it's, you know, the short answer to that question is almost, if you turn on the radio, almost every song that you hear went down without written music. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's been, that's been true since, you know, since rock and roll, mm -hmm. you know, or even folk music took over. Um, I, I do read music, you know, I, uh, you know, I write symphonies, yeah. <laughs> um, but most of the time when I'm in the studio, that's, that's, that doesn't come up. Right. It doesn't come up. I know a lot of great producers, you know, Dr. Dre among them who, who don't read a note, uh, um, you know, DJ Premier, uh, he knows the notes, but I don't, you know, I, I don't think he's actually had to read or write music in his entire career. Right. Um, now, having said that, you know, as an educated musician myself, you know, there are times when reading music is, I, I think it's a really good pursuit, you know. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm actually in a funny position because I'm a really good reader for a guitarist, mm -hmm. which basically means I suck at reading. You uh -huh. know? <laughs> because guitar players are just infamously bad at reading. Yeah. But I, I, I am, you know, I do actually get calls to do sessions because I'm a reading guitarist. Oh, okay. Even though a, any saxophone player or violinist, you know, would just, you know, drag me behind the oh, truck yeah. in terms of reading. You know, I mean, I'm not that great of a reader, but guitarists are so bad usually <laughs> uh, that I'm actually pretty good. So. Having said that, you know, it's, I would encourage you to, uh, to learn how to read, but to answer your question honestly, yeah, you know, um, if you don't read, don't think that that means that you can't produce records or be a studio musician mm -hmm. or play in a band, you know, I mean, the Beatles didn't read, you know, right. uh, now George Martin did, you know, it's nice if you don't read to partner with somebody who can write some really cool charts for you, right. you know, but um, not everybody in the studio needs to know how to read. Absolutely not. Right. Uh, I've got a question from Andy. Um, he was interested in, in the, the challenges of um, collaboration that we're talking about mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of your experiences, um, uh, challenges that you've had collaborating with mix engineers on things that you've produced? Sure, absolutely. It's a little different than the artist side. Yeah, probably. that Mark Wessel, man, he's a, he's a, <laughs> a, a can of snakes. No, I'm just kidding. Mark is great. I, I've done a lot of records with, um, I've been blessed to work with a lot of fabulous mix engineers, some of whom teach online courses at Berkeley Music, right. uh, Rich Mendelson as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, you know, and, and I've, 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 okay, so challenges. Let's do this. Um, let me do. Let me put it this way. Let me give you advice on how to care and feeding sure. of your mix engineer. First off, don't sit there the whole time. Mm. You know the luxury of having a mix engineer is that you don't have to pollute your ears by being there the whole time. What I would recommend if you're working with a mix engineer is give them some good references. Mm -hmm. You know, give them. Uh, don't be shy about saying. You know, I really love the drums on this record. I really love the guitar on this record. I really love the vocals on this record. Um, you know, uh, or I really love, you know, the mixes of Tom Lord Algae, who right. has interviews in this course, by the way. Um, or I love, you know, the mixes of Gary Pachosa or whoever. Um, don't be afraid of saying that. Then I usually will come to the studio. I'll be there at the beginning and we'll just have a conversation. We might listen to the demo. We'll talk about it a little bit. And you could do this over email or over Skype or over the phone, too. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll talk about it. Then I will go away. I'll say, how long do you need until you're ready for me? Mm -hmm. And they'll usually give me some kind of a, a number, you know. Um, you know, give me, you know, why don't you come back at about 4 o'clock or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, so then I'll come back at that time, at that point in time, and I will not walk into the studio. I don't want to hear a sliver of the mix 
until they're ready for me to hear it. Okay. So I may wind up waiting. I mean, I did a record with Carl Beatty one time where, um, you know, he had a lot of trouble getting the monitors right at the beginning of the mix. So we, you know, I was, it wasn't two in the morning until we, we actually had something to listen to and it was maybe four in the morning, five in the morning by the time we could draw, bring the band in. And that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be in the room listening to things over and over again because it's that first listen, you know, that that you really get the best information from. Um, and so I will, once the engineer is ready to play it for me, I will come in, I'll sit down, I'll have my legal pad right there so I can take notes, mm -hmm. and I'll hit play and I'll just jot down little notes. It's really important to jot down notes so you're not having to try and remember all these things. Right. Um, and then, you know, maybe I'll listen to it one more time and jot down a few more notes, and then we'll just march through, you know, the issues that I have. We'll just we'll just march through those things. Now these days, of course, you know, a lot of mix engineers are different places. Um, I just mixed this uh, record. Uh, I just produced and engineered a record for Tubby Love, and we used a, a mix engineer uh, in New York uh, named Jocko, and so he would send us the mixes. I would essentially do the same thing. I would, you know, I would go into my project studio and I would turn off my phone and I would, you know, clear my mind and I would listen and I would take notes. Right. And then I would just email him, you know, all of the, you know, the list of specific things that I, that I, of issues I had. And, you know, he would get that. Maybe he'd call me on the phone and say, what did you mean by the, you know, we'd talk about it a little bit. And then he'd do updates and send them to me that way. Great. Um, but that's, you know, I love the luxury of having a mix engineer, you yeah. know, so many times these days. Um, you know, the same person is going to engineer it and mix it because there's just not the budget, you know, yeah. to, to do both. But it's it's great yeah. to, I love working with mix yeah. engineers when I have the budget, yeah. I think we have time for one more. Um, we've got a, a question from Blackheart. Uh, Steven, in your opinion, what is the hardest part about trying to get the best performance out of an artist? Uh, do you sometimes find it tough for the artist to feel fully comfortable with you? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, I I don't often have trouble. It, by the time we get to the vocals, uh, and I guess he's not necessarily talking necessarily about vocals, but the, the main thing is trust, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. If you can build a trusting relationship to where they know that you have their best interest at heart, right. and you know, you know, I, I will tell my artists, look, we're, I'm, this is your record and this is your vision. My job is to represent your vision the best way that we can possibly do that. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to put out anything that you're not absolutely thrilled with. You know? right. We're just not going to do it. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you can just relax you know, and realize that, that that's going to happen. And, and yeah. we're going to work on this as much as we need to work on it for your intention, your vision to really become crystallized. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to make it better than you even thought it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. And part of my job is, though, to try and move you out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. to get to the, a place, you know, that's that's higher than where you are now. Right. And that's why you hired me. Either, you know, if you didn't want me to do that, you wouldn't need me, you know. Right. Um, and, and once, you know, once they trust you and you trust them, because the, the fact is you've got to trust the artist too because, because you know, it's their record. There is, it, 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 it should never get to who has final say. You know, because you should have a trusting enough relationship that I realize that, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, there, there's a lot of battles that you don't win. You know, you right. push a little bit, you, you plant the seeds, you know, you can try coming straight at it if, if you know, if that's working with that particular artist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did an interview with George Martin years ago, and, and he talked about how, you know, you really just, the way he put it is, you know, it's very psychological. You just have you have to kid them along, you know, and and the the best thing is for them to take your idea, and by the end, they believe it was their idea, right? You know, which which is deflating to your own ego, you know, <laughs> because of like that that was my idea, but but that's that's the gig, you know. The gig is you know it's like being a film composer. You don't want people to notice the music, you know, and right. the, being a record producer is the same thing. You don't really want people to notice 
the record production. You want them to notice the artist and the song and the emotions that they're feeling when this just hits them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and all of us nerds now, you know, I know that, you know, people listening like me, you know, I do notice the production, but that's because we're into that, you know. Right. We're, we're the nerds that are looking behind the, the scenes and trying to figure out, you know, what yeah. all is going on. Most people, you know, they're not going to notice the production. If you did your job right, they're going to notice that this record makes them feel great mm -hmm. and they want to listen to it again yeah you know? definitely